Welcome, everyone. My name is Yvette Gauhan. I'm a Medical Affairs Associate Manager with Nestle Health Science, and I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker and assist with the webinar, Surgical Nutrition Intervention, Standard of Care. I am very pleased to present today's speaker, Mary Marinowski. Mary Marinowski is a Registered Dietitian Nutritionist and Medical Affairs Manager at Nestle Health Science. She earned her Bachelor's of Science in Dietetics at the University of Minnesota, and she completed her internship at Regions Hospital in St. Paul. Prior to her position with Nestle, Mary was a nutrition support and renal dietitian for eight years with Hennepin County Medical Center, which is a level one trauma center, and DaVita. Over the past 10 years, Mary has become very specialized in her studies of the clinical evidence surrounding the efficacy of perioperative immunonutrition protocols and work to develop a number of tools to assist implementation for clinicians and compliance for patients. Mary has helped to facilitate the North American Surgical Nutrition Summit and the reporting of these consensus recommendations. Mary also facilitates Nestle Nutrition Institute webinars on surgical nutrition as well as educational programs at the Aspen Annual Meeting. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Marinowski. So what I'd like to start with today is really providing you um, with a background, and we'll kind of um, use this as a backdrop of, for the objectives that I'll um, discuss with you in a little bit. But I, I just thought it would be important to try to show really why surgical nutrition is important and to describe a little bit best as I can the uh, uh, aspects of it in terms of what we'll discuss today. So surgical nutrition is important because surgical complications are a problem. And um, these are just a few facts. And the first one there is always quite, um, it, it definitely gets my attention that almost half of hospital costs that our institutions face today are related, are somehow related to surgery. And so there are complications that can follow after those surgeries, uh, certainly having a uh, complication after a general elective surgery increases the risk of a 30-day readmission by four times. Uh, and one of those common type of complications are surgical site infections. It's the, one of the most commonly cited. And you can see from this slide, it contributes to um, a good amount of direct cost and you can think about it in billions, but it may be more meaningful to kind of think of what an average surgical site infection costs the hospital, and that's in the neighborhood of $21,000. Um, and so in response to surgical complications, um, the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid have come up with some initiatives that I'm going to, uh, again, just kind of uh, give you as background to really um, encourage the um, improvement in uh, quality measures around uh, surgical outcomes. And so these CMS initiatives are based on what, they, what is termed the triple aim. And so it's this foundational concept to provide better care, achieve better health, and to do so um, with lower costs through quality improvement. And there are three programs I'll touch on here that um, that are reflective of, or really are in place to try to achieve that aim. The first one is the HAC present on admission indicator, so health um, acquired condition or hospital acquired condition. And this is the situation, and these measures have been in place for a while, so you may be familiar with them. But an example of this would be that if a patient comes into the hospital without a pressure injury, develops a pressure injury while they're in the hospital, that um, additional cost attributed to the pressure injury is something that Medicare would not reimburse since it happened in the hospital. Um, another program is the Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program, and this is um, looking particularly at certain um, diagnoses like um, cardi uh, coronary artery bypass graft and hip replacement. And if a hospital has uh, more readmissions uh, within 30 days of discharge than the other hospitals that they're compared against, that too can affect reimbursement. And then third, um, 
is called the HACC Reduction Program, um, Hospital Acquired um, Condition Reduction Program. And so this one I've, I've given, I've dedicated a whole slide to because I think that from the standpoint of surgical nutrition, these are things that we really can make a difference with. And so uh, each um, evaluation period, uh, CMS will look at what a hospital's hack reduction program score is. And here you can see how that score is weighted. 25% um, of it correlates with patient safety indicator measures, their PSI 90 measures. And the one that stands out to me of the 15 that are there um, that has a lot of, of relevance, I think, to nutrition is the wound dehiscence rate. And then, but 75% of the score relates to these various types of infections. So central line infections, um, catheter-associated UTIs, um, SSIs targeted, targeted specifically to certain surgeries that CMS has identified as areas for improvement, such as um, colonic and abdominal hysterectomies, and then MRSA infections, and of course, Clostridium difficile infections. And so a hospital um, will have, you know, a hack reduction program score, and then they're compared and um, uh, graduated, I think is the word I want to use. So basically the CMS looks at how hospitals are performing and what their scores are um, according to quartiles. And if your score ends up in that bottom quartile, that fourth quartile, um, then uh, there's an additional penalty to CMS reimbursement. And so, it, you know, all the hospitals are striving to reduce these kinds of things to definitely stay out of the, the fourth quartile and be in that upper, as high up in the, in the other three quartiles as possible. So we want to affect those kind of measures. And if we mean to do it with surgical nutrition, it's helpful to look at it on a timeline basis because there's a lot of different ways you can intervene with nutrition and a lot of it really depends on where you get access to the patient along the green arrow. So if you have the luxury to see somebody in a surgical clinic and do a nutritional assessment on them, say three weeks in advance of their surgery, you determine that they're malnourished, you're able to counsel them and also consider use of things like oral nutritional supplements to provide calories and protein to make a difference in their nutritional status, that is going to affect surgical outcome. Um, if you, most typically what I've heard about is patients seeing, you know, having that clinic visit about um, 10 to 14 days before surgery. And so it, that window tends to be um, one that allows for the um, protocol that in, uh, involves immunonutrition and today we'll be talking about the protocol for immunonutrition that contains um, arginine, supplemental um, EPA and DHA from fish oil, as well as nucleotides. And so I'm going to really focus above the green arrow on the provision of immunonutrition both before and after surgery. Uh, but I, I will also show um, how carbohydrate loading fits um, on a complementary basis into that protocol. And um, I don't. I would be remiss if I didn't say that patients getting discharged that are, are for any reason and may quite frequently be malnourished, um, you know, they certainly can benefit in their outcomes going forward by returning to taking some oral nutritional supplements and uh, perhaps even more importantly, having that intervention on the part of the dietitian in terms of um, which foods would be most helpful for them to eat. So that's the continuum of surgical nutrition, and I'm going to focus on immunonutrition with us today. And the first thing um, that I would want to say about immunonutrition and major elective surgery is just to um, be um, aware of how consistent the benefit has been shown. These are the main um, meta-analyses that have been done of randomized control trials around arginine supplemented immunonutrition since 2001. And there's consensus of benefit across all of these meta-analysis of randomized control trials. There's also an ever-growing list of major elective surgeries that have been studied. 
it started with GI cancer surgery, and then we had cardiac and head and neck and bladder cancer. And most recently, I'll be sharing some data with you today on gynoc cancer, some orthopedic data. I also have a study on ventral hernia repair. And um, there is a, some new data also on non-small cell lung cancer that's a little bit beyond the time that I have to share today. But I want to give you a good overview of the um, the various um, types of surgery that immunonutrition has been studied in. And so that's the background. So our objectives are, I'm actually gonna start off with sharing with you the basic science, or really talking about the mechanism of action uh, for the use of supplemental immunonutrients around, again, reducing those infectious complications. Then I would like to show um, some clinical outcomes that have been demonstrated in the literature. I'll show preoperative, perioperative, and postoperative studies in a variety of surgeries so that you can see um, some cl those clinical outcomes. And um, then I will finish with a discussion around quality practice um, initiatives and um, how health economic data is so important to them. So that's what we have out in front of us. And um, I look forward to having some time to do some Q&A with all of you at the end. So please jot down your questions as we go along. So here is my 30,000 foot view about the science that exists behind the standard of care. Um, the data supports that the trauma of surgery induces a state of arginine depletion. This arginine depletion um, causes T lymphocyte dysfunction and affects microperfusion. So you have immunosuppression and you have the potential of um, not being able to oxygenate the surgical wound as well as um, you would like to optimally. And we know that an immunonutrition intervention that includes supplemental arginine helps to restore immune function and optimize oxygen supply to the wound. So with that, let's take arginine first. And um, I'm gonna show you some of these metabolic pathways. But before I go down any pathways, um, first and foremost, recognize that L-arginine is a major fuel source for our T cells proliferation. So if you don't have a good supply of L-arginine or the body gets low on L-arginine, um, T cell proliferation will be affected. And right there, you know, immune function then is affected. And when surgery occurs, uh, I'm going to go down the side with the larger arrow first, uh, because when surgery occurs, Th2 cytokines are increased. And these cytokines are going to drive the induction of an enzyme labeled here as arginase 1. And so you, after surgery, there is a pull of arginine to go down this pathway, ultimately resulting in the production of hydroxyproline and collagen that is important to healing. And then you see the arrow on the other side, the right-hand side, and it is um, much um, smaller, but yet still important because it's made smaller because the arrow smaller because we want to emphasize that uh, the arginine, the big pull of the arginine after the surgery is towards the arginase one side, but the body constantly works to keep a certain amount of arginine going towards the production of endothelial nitric oxide because the body needs to maintain what they call a constitutive level or a baseline level at um, the va in the vascular in the vascular system, whether those are large vessels or tiny, you know, micro vessels, it's very important to maintain a baseline level of endothelial nitric oxide there in order to provide the optimal amount of oxygenation and mic micro perfusion to the surgical wound. And so what I'd like to show next is let's go into and look kind of more at a cellular level on the arginase pathway. So here you can see a certain type of cell called a myeloid-derived suppressor cells. They are talked about more in the literature now and I expect will be um, more so in the future. And there, this is where the arginase-1 enzyme is primarily concentrated. And so you have major elective surgery occur and levels of TH2 cytokines like interleukin-13 um, increase. Um, and when that happens, the um, arginase is induced and arginine moves into the MDSCs. 
And as I showed before, you get ornithine and urea that ultimately go down a pathway for collagen production. The additional thing to think about when this is happening after major surgery is, you know, what happens if the arginine runs out? Um, we know that that will increase the risk of infection because those T lymphocytes won't have as much of it around as they need. And we know that there will be an increased risk of inadequate microperfusion because it'll be more difficult for the body to maintain that level of um, endothelial nitric oxide. And this is um, the activity of myeloid derived suppressor cells has been shown really nicely. This is from the University of Kansas and Jill Hamilton Reeves. And she did a study where she took um, a population of bladder cancer patients. This is a pilot randomized control trial. And in one of the groups, the study group, they received specialized immunonutrition that contained arginine, fish oil, and nucleotides. That's the blue line in the, in the graph. And then the other group received or, uh, you know, standard oral nutritional supplement. And then she measured the um, activity of these MDSCs. And what you can see is that there was a striking difference, striking difference in um, the activity of the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Uh, there, was a, there was much less activity when specialized immunonutrition was used as compared to um, the ONS. And this correlated with a uh, lower infection rate at 90 days when the two um, groups were compared in relationship to antibiotic use. So it's really cool when an investigator, I think, it brings that mechaniz mechanism of action into the clinical outcomes that they observe. And so half of the equation um, we've kind of talked about in terms of that risk of infection um, in some detail now. Uh, with depleted arginine, I want to spend a little bit of time, too, on uh, the other half of the equation when we think about the decrease in endothelial nitric oxide and what that means for tissue oxygenation and, and ultimately wound breakdown. And to do this, what I'm going to use is this uh, landmark study from Braga from Surgery 2002. And in this study, he has four groups of colorectal surgery patients. And one of the groups is, you can see there with the legend, is getting preoperative immunonutrition that contains the blend of the three immunonutrients. One group is getting, the green uh, line is getting the um, it, the supplement before and after surgery. And then you have another two groups. The purple line is a isonitrogenous isocaloric um, standard oral nutritional supplement. And then you have conventional, which really in this case means no, no supplement, no intervention. And so the real apples to apples comparison here, when we look at the variance in the oxygenation level, um, is between the two preoperative groups. And uh, you may be wondering how they were able and what exactly they are measuring here. Uh, what happened with these um, colorectal surgery patients is that in a subset of them, in four different subsets, as you can see, they placed some probes so that the doctor could actually measure the gut oxygen tension right at the level of the anastomosis. And um, the goal, um, often um, is to keep the, the gut oxygen tension at 60 millimeters of mercury or greater. Below that threshold is where um, a, a lot of surgeons will tell you that they get concerned about the anastomosis being able to heal, um, and they get concerned about breakdown. And so you can see now, if you compare the blue line with the purple line, that even at the very start of surgery, because of the patients having preoperative immunonutrition, they're registering higher gut oxygen tension, and they are able to maintain that um, at most times above that 60 millimeters of mercury line in comparison to the preoperative ONS. The preoperative ONS, in contrast, is very similar in the line that you know, that's charted here as doing nothing um, when it comes to oxygenation of the anastomosis. So 
um, I hope that kind of really helps to bring uh, what we say about oxygenation and perfusion with the use of immunonutrition. I hope that helps to illustrate that. Um, if it doesn't, we have another cartoon uh, or a little cartoon here that would help. And here you can kind of see where there are some stitches, where there's an anastomosis in the bowel, and then it telescopes out to show you in one case where the immunonutrition was used and in the other where it was the standard formula or no intervention and the difference in the oxygenation um, as shown in the visual. But alas, arginine is not the whole story. And um, it's important to talk about the other immunonutrients as well. Um, with N3 fatty acids, I'm sure you're familiar with EPA and DHA and how they've been studied to help minimize the inflammatory response by decreasing the production not only of inflammatory mediators, but other, um, and to, uh, other items or other um, chemical entities that we have since been discovered and written about, like resolvins, protectins, and myricins. Um, we also know that these fatty acids help to increase the immune, immune response by enhancing lymphocyte function. And we also know that they interact with arginine. And in, on the next slide, we have some in vitro data that helps to show that. Now, I know there's a lot to look here, so I'm going to talk you through it. Um, when you look over here at the control, that would be um, the strongest example you'll see on the slide of arginase expression. So remember, when arginase is induced, then the arginine is going to be um, taken and you know, it will go down that arginase pathway and essentially be lost to the use of it with lymphocytes or you know, decrease, it'll decrease that pool in relationship to how much the lymphocytes have available to themselves. And so the question is, you know, if we, if we utilize different fatty acids in a formula, are we able to influence the expression of arginase? And so when you look at fish oil, the main um, metabolic product is the prostaglandin E3. And when that is combined here, as you see highlighted, in the presence of interleukin-13, that's one of the most common um, TH2 cytokines, you see that the amount of induction of arginase is the least of the other two examples, whether it's corn oil or borage oil. So essentially, what this is saying is that the use of fish oil, EPA and DHA, may blunt the activity of arginase and in that regard help to sustain a pool of arginine that is more available to immune cells. Okay, then we have nucleotides and um, I hope this little picture here is helpful in terms of um, the, the helix that we're all familiar with when it comes to DNA. But think if you would, if, if this helix was unwrapped or flattened out, you'd have a ladder, right? And these um, little um, rungs of the ladder, those would be your nucleotides. And so those are the purine and pyrimidine bases that we on the whole just call nucleotides. Um, nucleotides are indispensable in stress states, and I'll talk more about that on a, the next slide where I look at the metabolism of nucleotides. But they really are essential when you think about you know, genetic material and how it's needed for the replication of any cell. And that becomes particularly important in the patient under stress where you have immune cells that are trying to rapidly replicate. And I used to always just think of immune cells as, as lymphocytes that were formed in the, blood mar in the uh, bone marrow and found in the blood. But as dietitians, I know we're um, all very aware of at least 70 or more percent of our systemic immune function being related to our gut associated lymphoid tissue. So the lymphatic or the lymphoid tissue, the lymphocyte tissue there, as well as what's produced in our bone marrow, um, are both really important to consider in how assisting their rapid replication supports immune function. 
And then, oh, this is, I put this preview in here because I'm going to come to this data in a little bit, but um, it's really uh, more of a teaser than anything else. But I will show you the data that supports that a combination of arginine, fish oil, and nucleotides, all three were required to show a statistically significant benefit in major elective surgery. But before we get to that, let's look a little bit more here at nucleotide metabolism. And there's a lot on this slide. I mean, um, I think it uh, quite honestly is very interesting to think about how the structure includes a sugar and, and various numbers of phosphate groups, and that influences how it's named. But the real takeaway from this slide is thinking about how the body um, is going to use one of two methods to um, metabolize nucleotides. And so in the stressed state, the body prefers the salvage pathway. And the salvage pathway means that the body is relying on these bases to be available pre, um, in their intact form. And so cytosine, uracil, guanine, adenine, these are all bases that um, are purine or pyrimidine bases that when they're attached to the rest of the chain, um, create four different kinds of nucleotides. And if the body that's under stress does not have a good, you know, a supply of these, um, then, you know, the, that supply really becomes the rate limiting factor in the salvage pathway. And then essentially what you're telling to the body is that, well, you have to make them from scratch. And that's the de novo synthesis pathway, which is no problem for, you know, any healthy ambulatory person to um, to uh, to do, but it um, when you think about a, a person that's under stress and has had a major surgery and all the different needs that their body is trying to prioritize, this is one where it's very simple to add RNA in the form of yeast extract and make sure that that rate limiting factor to the salvage pathway is supplied with the nucleotides that um, are so essential to the replication of immune cells. So I hope that's helpful and gives you a little bit more information on that. And um, it leads me into the Drover study. So now we're kind of entering the part of the presentation where I'm gonna share evidence with you. Um, the Drover meta-analysis is a meta-analysis of uh, more, actually more than 30 uh, randomized control trials, and it's still the largest meta-analysis done on a variety of major elective surgeries, so almost 3,500 patients. And um, of the studies that it includes, 28 of those studies did look at infectious complications, and we see a 41% reduction when arginine-supplemented diets were used in comparison to most typically ONS. Um, they also looked at length of stay and found that two to three day reduction in length of stay. And where the Drover data really starts to get exciting is in the sub-analyses. And the one that I'm going to concentrate on here with the yellow highlight is Drover took 21 studies that all utilized a formula that contained these three immunonutrients. Um, and then looked at the outcomes from those studies in relationship to seven other studies where other immunonutrition formulas were used and found a significant difference between the outcomes um, that were reported. And so the PETA plot, um, the, plot the plots on here, the, the data points, if you will, they all um, are in relationship to a um, relative risk relative risk ratio. And so the closer they are to the line, really the, the less difference the intervention made. This is sort of called the line of difference or indifference, however you want to um, think about it. So um, essentially the other formulations that contained arginine but didn't have all three immunonutrients um, really did not make any significant difference in um, reducing infection risk whereas the combination of the three here actually gives you an RR of 0.49, so that equates to a 51% reduction in risk of infectious complications. 
And um, I get asked a lot as to what were these other diets. And um, what I've done here, and I realize that this is a CE presentation, but I have listed these brands on this slide because I've listed only and all of the brands that were involved in studies in the Drover meta-analysis. So I've covered you know, everything that can be covered. And I think that it's helpful to be able to show you that and also show you uh, the differences in the formulas. So you can see here that the other products are in the, um, the other formulas are in the yellow bars and none of them contain nucleotides. The other takeaway for me is that the, in general, they contain lesser amounts of arginine. So I hope that's helpful in, in you know, being able to see more deeply into those results. And another aspect of formula composition that I think is really important to look at is carbohydrate content. And so I want to share this abstract from CNW from 2017. These were normal volunteers, so they weren't surgery patients. They hadn't gone through the stress of surgery. If anything, you might, find, you might expect to find the results that were observed more pronounced in someone that would be under stress. But the idea here was to compare two oral um, immunonutrition supplements, one with 15 grams of carbohydrate per portion and one with 45 grams of carbohydrate per portion, and to see what that meant to plasma uh, glucose and insulin response. And you can see in both cases, it was a statistically significant difference. The higher carbohydrate uh, formula promoted a higher mean plasma glucose and a higher insulin response, whereas the lower carbohydrate um, was, was lower in both cases. And you know this is important because I think, as you all know, hyperglycemia increases risk of infection postoperatively. And when you look on the left side of this slide, you know, Typically, um, you know, we say, first and foremost, I should say, we think about hyperglycemia with patients that have diabetes. And what Quan did in this very large um, study is that he took, I think it was 11,000 or 12,000 colorectal surgery patients. So you're looking at a lot of patients here. Um, and I can tell by my bars it's 12,000 because you've got 4,000 um, with diabetes and um, almost 8,000 without. The green parts of these bar graphs show the people that had a blood sugar either on the day of surgery or on one of the two post-operative days that followed that was over 180. And as you would expect, the people with diabetes had more, but there is a significant number of patients here that didn't have diabetes that had the, the stress hyperglycemia that can follow surgery. And so when you think about carbohydrate content of immunonutrition, it's important to think about people with diabetes and those without, because if either type of patient has a high blood sugar uh, over 180 on the day of surgery, you can see that their risk is about 60% higher for an infection. If they have one also on post-op day one or post-op day two, that risk goes up you know, to 200% or you know, excuse me, that's 100% more than they started with. So you go from 60% to 100%, but then the risk almost triples if they have um, a high blood sugar on all three of those days. So it's definitely something to consider in that regard. Um, now I'm gonna take you through an evidence review of some separate types of, of surgeries and um, scenarios where it's pre-op, peri-op, and post-op. So this first one is on bladder cancer surgery, and um, the control was retrospective. And in this population of bladder cancer surgery patients, uh, preoperative immunonutrition with the blend of three ingredients um, was associated with lower uh, postoperative complication rate, lower infection rate, and a lower rate of paralytic, paralytic ileus. So that's your preoperative example. Um, the perioperative example comes from University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where they had a population of, of high-risk head and neck cancer patients. The um, standard of care included uh, uh, this, a standard tube feeding formula post-op. The immunonutrition patients had um, immunonutrition both preoperatively 
and postoperatively in the form of a tube feeding. Um, and I, so the pre-op was oral and the tube feeding uh, was post. And you can see here a, a very large decrease in uh, postoperative complications, particularly in pharyngeal leaks and fistulas. This was the most common complication. And length of stay, again, was reduced uh, by that two to three day um, indication. So that's a perioperative example. And then this last one is a postoperative example. This is from Dr. Chapman at um, University of uh, San Francisco, um, University of California, San Francisco. And um, she's concentrated here on a population of gynonc patients. And you may recall in the, the beginning, I showed you that one of the markers that contribute to that hack reduction score is the SSIs and hysterectomies. So this goes directly to, to that issue. And she's concentrated on SSI. She found that in the patients that received postoperative immunonutrition, so this is postoperative only, they had significantly less SSIs. And if they did get an SSI, it was, they were 78% less likely to develop a severe one. And if they did get an SSI with the immunonutrition, they also required fewer interventions that are listed here in terms of um, return to the OR, readmissions, negative pressure wound treatment, et cetera. So that's just a sampling of three different kinds of surgeries and the protocol used in three different ways. So here's the entire you know, uh, protocol, the preoperative section, the postoperative section, and of course, the whole thing taken together would be the perioperative. And it's, it's data like I've showed you from the Drover meta-analysis, those randomized control trials that have really contributed to what we see in the critical care nutrition guidelines these days. And I'm really happy that for the first time, um, these were last printed in 2016, we see the word perioperative mentioned in applying these various immunonutrients to, um, to surgical care. And um, we also see a, a, a reminder to get it going early. Um, we've always, you know, we've typically had guidelines around the post-operative use, although they've strengthened it now and said routine use, which is great to see. Um, and then thirdly, I, I just think it's wonderful that as dietitians, we all finally have a guideline we can point to about why patients don't need to be maintained on clear liquids um, for, you know, ad nauseum after surgery, because the sooner that we can get them eating solids that they can tolerate, we know the better the outcome will be. So we'll take a moment here just to summarize quickly. Uh, what I've shown is that immunonutrients appear to synergize in alleviating arginine depletion. Um, we know that Outcomes such as complication rates, length of stay, and readmission have all shown improvement by using proven surgical immunonutrition. And um, I will be showing you more about the financial upside. So it's, it's really an exciting time um, to have so much at our fingertips to show the value of it. And this is a slide where I just really want to encourage all of you um, in the use of this intervention because you have the opportunity, most importantly, to get better outcomes for your patients, but for yourselves, for your institutions, and ultimately our healthcare system. Uh, what, what, we're, what you're able to do with immunonutrition is really exactly what the country needs when it comes to, you know, um, interventions that save money and improve outcomes. And that combination isn't so frequent to be found in interventions. And this is an area where um, <clears throat> it is. And it's possible, um, and I'm trying to make as much noise, certainly as I can, with surgeons, with administrators, and with payers, so that that, that gets recognized. Um, one of the best ways to do it is to you know, implement a protocol. But it is the challenge because we have this great evidence base, yet an awareness is growing, but there's still a lag in implementing um, this intervention. And so I would encourage you all to really seize this opportunity for your patients and for yourselves in regards to um, recognition. And a great way to do this is to um, implement the protocol in the form of a quality practice improvement. 
And so I'm going to show you a few examples of how that's been done, um, inspirational examples, I hope. And the first one is Strong for Surgery. So this started as a public health campaign in Washington State, initially on colorectal surgery, but it's advanced to many other types of surgery. And it continues to be a quality improvement um, initiative or uh, tool, I would say, that many hospitals in um, Washington State and in Oregon continue to employ. Um, the program um, garnered so much attention that it's been adopted by the American College of Surgeons, and the website you see on your slide um, is their website, where you can go and get access to these pre-surgical checklists. That's what this program is really about, is a nutrition checklist that utilizes evidence-based immunonutrition, um, a smoking cessation um, checklist, a medication checklist, and a blood sugar control checklist. And the data from Strong for Surgery that was published by Thornglade shows a 23% lower risk of prolonged length of stay when the nutrition checklist was used with immunonutrition. And so this shows you the checklist. It's kind of divided here into three parts. You have your malnutrition screen. You also have an albumin check that they're doing to assess surgical risk, not nutritional status. Um, these, these two parts of the, the checklist are really there so that the surgeon can decide if the patient's healthy enough to have surgery. If it's deemed that they're not, that they're too malnourished to go through surgery, then um, too much of a risk, then, you know, perhaps it's going to take a couple of weeks of, um, it might even be parenteral nutrition, it may be tube feeding, it may be standard oral nutritional supplements, but they're trying to get that addressed first if someone really is not in shape for surgery. Um, whether they are malnourished or not, the um, Strong for Surgery checklist indicates the use of evidence-based immunonutrition. So if the surgeons decided that they're going forward with surgery, and that's, that will be the case with many uh, well-nourished patients, and it will be also the case with some malnourished patients. They both have shown to benefit both those groups from evidence-based immunonutrition. And then we had Dr. Banerjee um, in 20, later in the same year in 2017. He took the Strong for Surgery data, and he did a health economic analysis based on the outcomes around readmission. So we had 1,716 colorectal surgery patients that um, had that received the checklist. Um, some of those patients received also the immunonutrition, and that's your purple line, but some of them were checklisted and for um, a variety of reasons did not um, take, either receive or take the immunonutrition, and that created the opportunity to um, look at a control group in reference. And so at 30 days after um, index admission for surgery, 90 days and 180 days, um, these colorectal patients that had immunonutrition showed a 50 to 58% reduction in readmission. And when you look at what that means in dollars and cents, you can see that at the index, at the index hospitalization discharge, it was $2,400 difference. But when you kept following them out in terms of hospital costs, it kept growing. And by six months post-op, the difference in those two groups was $5,300. So I really, um, I always like to show this because I, it shows kind of a long range look at the difference that the intervention makes. It also shows that at index discharge, that this $2,400 is very um, close to an amount that was um, arrived at in a previous health economic analysis of immunonutrition containing the blend of the three ingredients from Dr. Moskoff. That was in 2012. And so I think it um, adds additional you know, robustness to both the studies that they both kind of came up with uh, an amount upon discharge from the index admission that was agreeing with each other. And the other thing I like about Dr. Moskoff's work is she did the sensitivity analysis. So as if your base complication rate is not at the national average of around 20%, let's say you're starting at 10 or even five, or you can go as low as three, um, she was able to project that it was still cost effective to provide the immunonutrition when you compared the hospital cost savings. 
Okay, and here is another quality practice improvement um, study that is very new. It's from the Annals of Surgery at the very end of last year, 2018, that I want to share with you. For the, it, it definitely inspires me. It's uh, from Indiana Health, Indiana University, and um, what they did is they gave a preoperative wellness bundle that contained all these items, including immunonutrition, um, to 6,538 patients. That was in the intervention group. And then there was a pre-intervention group that was uh, prior to them doing the, you know, prior to them initiating this bundle, they compared it with 9,202 other surgeries. And across both groups, you had a whole variety of different types of surgeries here. So a, a real mix of major elective surgery. And then they looked at what their outcomes were in terms of those very measures that can contribute to the hack reduction score or the hack reduction measures. And so surgical site infection was statistically um, significantly reduced, as well as CAUTI, as well as C. diff, and patient safety indicators went from 55 to zero. So they have some really exciting results. Um, and this is reflective of an organization whose administration bought these wellness bundle contents, bought these wellness bundle kits for all these patients, these 6,538 patients. And so they were able to show, and it says in this paper, that they recouped the cost of the kits for their administration, plus they um, show that they have saved an additional $1 million with the use of those kits um, in relationship to hospital uh, costs. So I wanna, I'm want to. i aware of the time, and I'm, I'm going to try to go a little fast here at the end, but I would be remiss to talk about quality practice improvement in surgery and not talk about enhanced recovery protocols. And so this is a concept that I think many are familiar with. It um, reflects uh, a whole bundle of protocols and a process that was first developed in Europe and you can see that there are probably 15 to 20 different protocols here. And some are preoperative, some are intraoperative, and some are postoperative. And when uh, the Europeans first developed this concept, the two things that they um, pointed out in regards to nutrition were early oral nutrition and then also the part about carbohydrate loading. And so when we look at the outcomes of the enhanced recovery protocol bundle, of, you know, the whole bundle of protocols, we can look to studies from Duke and UVA. And when all the protocols together are, have um, good compliance, they are showing the reduction in complications and the reduction in length of stay that are very comparable to um, an immunonutrition protocol alone. And um, the bundle of protocols has been required to achieve significant improvements in clinical outcomes. And in regards to carbohydrate loading, I think it's interesting that if you separate the intervention out and try to measure the incremental benefit that it brings, the Cochrane Review and some other meta-analyses, AMER was the most recent one in 2016, they did not find any difference in length of stay when the carb load was compared with studies that utilized water or placebo. Um, however, it's been, very, it's been shown very clearly that patient satisfaction um, is definitely improved by the patient having something that they're able to drink um, close to surgery when they're not able, you know, of course, to eat. And so that's no small thing to take into consideration either. But it is, I think, interesting to notice that the, the clinical benefit associated with that intervention alone is not very large. Um, then we have our American Society of Enhanced Recovery that came on the scene about five years ago. And um, they have published an implementation guide that includes these three aspects. So they're talking about avoiding preoperative starvation using carbohydrate loading, and then and, and using, this is an important and, immunonutrition that contains the three immunonutrients shown um, in the literature to be beneficial. This is how carb loading and immunonutrition can very um, nicely live together. Um, the immunonutrition would start about six days before the surgery. The carb loading intervention happens the night before surgery 
and or two hours before surgery. And then after surgery, you go on with the immunonutrition. So the the use of these two different nutrition interventions should never be seen as competitive because they're very complementary to each other. And um, what I'm going to kind of wrap things up with today are some studies where they utilized um, the whole bundle of enhanced recovery protocols, but they also added immunonutrition in. So I would kind of call these studies that are following the ACER guide of implementation. This first one is from Brazil. It's in hip surgery, and essentially you had the one group with enhanced recovery protocols as well as immunonutrition and the other group without. They showed um, a significant difference here in length of stay. They also showed um, postoperatively a significant decrease in inflammation. So that's in hip surgery. Then we have this data from Majumder. This is from a University Hospital in Cleveland where they were looking at ventral hernia repair. And so one group uh, retrospectively did not receive the enhanced recovery protocols. The other one did, and they um, see that when they measured 90-day readmissions, that they see a 75% decrease. In addition to those to that improvement in outcome, they also had a more rapid diet advancement and a shorter time to oral narcotics. So that switch over from IV to oral narcotics was shorter and a reduced length of stay. And the last study here is um, is a very interesting one. It's like nothing else that I present because it's it's really a first of its kind. Um, this is from Medical University of South Carolina and it's GI cancer surgery patients. And all the patients in this study received enhanced recovery protocol bundles. And all the patients in this study received immunonutrition with the blend of three ingredients. The difference was that one group had their immunonutrition provided to them with a grant, and the other group was self-pay. And so this is really great information to share when you're talking with administrators or payers because they show differences in clinical outcome. Uh, less, a lower length of stay in the group that was um, funded as well as lower SSI and lower readmission rates. So pretty exciting stuff when immunonutrition is combined with enhanced recovery protocols. And so uh, I hope that I've been able to show really the importance of um, relating clinical outcomes and health economic outcomes to protocol implementation. Um, in summary, you know, we've shared today the uh, studies that look at preoperative, perioperative, and postoperative use of this combination of three immunonutrients. And we've looked at it versus other com other combinations that have not been shown effective. Uh, we've talked about the mechanistic role that each of these immunonutrients has to these clinical outcomes. And then we've also shown the, the health economics associated with it. And um, I hope you'll find that helpful in your implementation of quality initiatives. So with that, I will send it back to my colleague Yvette for your questions. Thank you so much. What an amazing um, presentation. A lot of really good information. And uh, I know we just have a couple of minutes here to address some questions, so I'm going to go ahead and just get started here. We do have a few that are coming in right now. Um, one of the questions is, uh, what carb-loading drinks are recommended? Um, is it something that just regular juice is okay, or is there something more specific to reach that carbohydrate amount? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, facilities all over the country are doing a variety of things. Um, and, uh, you know, I showed that one paper with um, hip surgery. In that case, they were using a, multi a maltodextrin-based drink. Um, but I do know of other facilities, like I mentioned, the, the work that um, UVA and also Duke has published. And I know in the sense of um, UVA continues to use um, a sports drink. And so you have a lot of, uh, and I know of other practices, um, some strong for surgery hospitals, for instance, out in Washington State are using apple juice. And so 
it, um, I don't think we have a lot of strong data to tell us if one form of carbohydrate is better than the other. Um, I did listen to a presentation, and some of you may have heard it too, from Kate Wilcutts at, at University of Virginia. She talks on this topic quite frequently. And um, she um, has, there's some data that shows, um, it was done in the Netherlands, I think, where they used maltodextrin and they compared that with a lemonade, and they did not find any um, significant differences um, with that. And so uh, I think that we will continue to see people using a variety of different carb loading forms um, until we have uh, more data that would indicate that, that one is better than the other. So I hope, thank you for your question. Yes, yes. Um, we do have another question I'll ask here. And, and again, in, in, based on the evidence that you've shown today around immunonutrition, is there any data specific or including uh, the amino acid glutamine? And where does that fall within um, immunonutrition? Yeah, it's a, another great question. Um, and what's interesting is that the glutamine always gets listed in the critical care guidelines, yet nobody is supplementing glutamine in an immunonutrition um, uh, formula. And so that always strikes me as interesting. Um, if you go and look at the, um, the literature and when glutamine was supplemented by itself, you don't see that it made a difference, at least not with um, GI cancer surgery. I don't know other surgeries where that's been looked at in isolation, but the use of glutamine in isolation has not been associated with improved outcomes in, um, in major elective surgery. But I really want to thank you, Mary, for your um, very, very informative presentation, a lot of very good evidence to share and health economic data. Um, we do appreciate everyone's participation today. So with that, on behalf of the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we hope that you found this information useful to your practice and enjoy the rest of your day.